Hello, my name is Andy McCarran, and this is the SBC Leaders Podcast, where we speak to some of the leading lights of the gambling industry. And today, I'm really pleased to announce that I've got Brent Almeida, CCO of BV Group, with me, who run the Bet Victor brand and others. Brent, how are you doing? Yeah, great, Andy. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for joining us here in Barcelona. It's a it's a really nice day, uh, and uh, yeah, looking forward to a good conversation. So, uh, obviously, um, BV Group, based out of Gibraltar. Victor were one of the earlier, um, probably the pioneers of um, using Gibraltar as a, as a hub for uh, remote betting, as, as it was then. Um, how was how was that transition to how uh, BV Group operates uh, in that jurisdiction today? Yeah, definitely. As you said, I mean, Bet Victor and, and even prior to that, Victor Chandler have a, a long heritage, um, not just in Gibraltar but in the, the gambling industry. Um, and you know, definitely seen as a pioneer in in moving operations to to Gibraltar around the setup of the the online gambling regime there. Um, something we're very proud of. Um, and in terms of you know commitment to Gibraltar as the jurisdiction, uh, certainly nothing's nothing's changed with that commitment. If anything, it's it's probably grown over time. Um, we've got a number of satellite offices around the world, mostly development hubs. Um, but of our you know global um, employee base of around eight hundred people, I'd say. Roughly eighty percent of those are are actually based or working out of of Gibraltar, um, and that includes you know everything from say the you know operational staff, compliance staff, you know teams that may normally be outsourced to other jurisdictions, um, all the way up to our core IT and engineering teams, my commercial teams, uh, and our entire executive leadership team um, is all based in Gibraltar. You know I, I think. We appreciate it's a small place. It's um, it's very competitive to to find and hire local talent there, um, but I think the the benefits of having that local nexus, you know, far outweigh the challenges. Um, I think just you know tying back to the theme of of this podcast and and leadership, I think one of those one of those main benefits is the ability to to lead your teams much better, and most importantly, I think cultivate that next generation of leaders um, when you're all there in in one place and spending time with each other collaborating and and working as a team sure i mean you say 80 percent of the of the workforce are based there I, I don't suppose there's many other companies with that higher percentage no i think i mean we're we're not the largest gaming company in gibraltar by employee footprint but i think of the the Say B to C operators that are actually headquartered in Gibraltar. I think we we probably do have the largest footprint of those. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. And um, you've got um, you, you mentioned you've got you know, satellite areas, you know, around the globe. I mean, from a leadership perspective, how how do you um, you know weigh up that challenge of speaking to those different teams on the different time zones, potentially with different cultures? You know, what, what, what's what's your approach on that? It obviously brings about challenges. I mean. It, it's interesting because while we do have satellite offices in different areas of the world at at BV, um, compared to previous roles I've had, because of that local nexus in Gibraltar, it's actually much different, and and there's um, there's less dependency on managing remote teams. I would say certainly for me, where all of my commercial teams are actually you know either based in Gibraltar or you know in a very close time zone, um, but I think you know in in Prior roles I've had, I mean, I started my career with with G Tech, now IGT, global lottery and gaming company. Um, everything I did was working with remote teams, um, and then later on, uh, you know, helping to start and then and then run a fintech company where we had offices on you know nearly every continent, covering a twenty four by seven period. Uh, you know, I got very used to the challenges that that come with that, and I think you know while today. We have tools that allow us to manage the day-to-day remote relationships and operations more effectively. You know, whether it's Slack or Teams or Zoom, um, you know, nothing can replace that sort of face-to-face personal collaboration. So, you know, one of the things that I've learned, you know, over the years and that I try to even use now is to make sure when we have those remote relationships, you know, I still try to cultivate those, you know, personal connections with members of my team. So you know, even if that's taking the time at the end of a call to, you know, find out what's going on in their life or, you know, what the kids are up to or what series they're watching. It's little things like that that, you know, create those bonds that 
you know, then help down the road where, you know, you, you need to figure out what makes different people tick and adapt to, to that, to get the most out of, out of your team. So I think that's key is making sure while we use all these, you know, these tools that aid in, um, remote working, we don't lose sight of the fact that, you know, real sort of teamwork and collaboration is based on personal connections and we have to go that extra step to, to try to cultivate those. Yeah. I mean, I think I've seen something where, um, when you're challenging managers, if they've got a personal connection with their people, is it, um, the first question is, do you know the name of their other half? <laughs> and it's all very well to, um, you know, ask that question, but you know, you've got to remember it as well. <laughs> and we joke about it, but it's not, you know, it, it's not sort of the simple, do you know, you know, the name of their other half or if they have kids, it's actually real questions that drive, you know, the motivations and ambitions of your team. And, you know, leadership is not a one size fits all approach. You know, sometimes you, I don't know, listen to, you know, different podcasts or, you know, gurus who give these sort of lessons on leadership. Um, and for me, it's definitely not a one size fits all approach. And you need to take into account, you know, what makes different people tick and what their personal situations are, what their motivations are, what their fears, maybe their weaknesses, their insecurities. And, you know, it takes a different approach to get the most out of people. And if you don't understand, you know, maybe the personal situations that drive why they perform or don't perform the way they do, you know, you're not going to get the the most out of people, nor are you going to have a, you know, the, the optimum working relationship. So yeah, I think it's really key that you take the time to get to know your people. And as a leader, you can adapt your style to what your different team members need to perform most effectively. Yeah, no, that, that's interesting. I mean, uh, you mentioned your role at GTech and, and the start, was it WaveTech? Wave, WaveCrest, sorry. Yeah. Um, and I suppose you've seen different um, different profiles of leadership and how to get, employ them yourself with different sort of um, different ways of uh, motivating and um, you know working with working with your team. So it's um, would you say Bet Victor's kind of like BV groups like the happy medium between those two extremes? <laughs> it's an interesting question because I, I think you would assume that uh, you know the, uh, a startup environment requires a different leadership style than than a larger company. Um, and don't get me wrong, uh, the, the environments are very different. Um, and I think, you know, leadership or what, you know, a great leader does may be more visible in that smaller environment, but I'd actually argue it's, it's probably even more important in a larger company where, you know, things like bureaucracy or complacency start to creep in, um, and you have a real risk of, you know, value erosion or value destruction if your teams are not, you know, motivated and, and led properly. So, so I actually think it's, it's even more important in that environment in a startup, you generally get people who are ambitious, motivated to be there. You know, it's easy to get people excited about building something new and, you know, you're the underdog taking on the leaders in an industry. Um, but when you're operating in a larger company in a more mature industry, that's been there for a while, the challenges are very different and it's, you know, how do we identify our weaknesses and how do we proactively drive change to, you know, improve in those areas, maybe before they're exposed by, by the competition. That's a very different set of challenges and ones that, that require, I think, much more thoughtful and focused leadership than, you know, in a startup, you, you typically get the guy, you know, you know, stands up and inspires people with a, you know, motivational speech and we're the underdog. And it's very different in a larger company. And, and I think, in many ways, it's much more difficult and requires that that really strong re leader that adapts to different situations, adapts to different people, um, and tailors their leadership approach based on that. You recently, um, the whole group on, under under like a bit of a rebranding. Uh, I'm assuming, but as tends to be the case, a bit of reorganisation comes with that. Uh, do you want to take us through some of the the changes that have been made and um, some of the brands that you guys are working with now? Yeah, and I'll take a step back a little bit because when even before I joined. So I think the last 10 years at Bet Victor and now BV Group, you know, have really been transformational for the organization. I think, you know, most people in the industry are familiar with Victor Chandler and and the sort of the history of, of the company. Um, but when he left um, and new management came in, you know, the first sort of, I'd say, theme there was very much, you know, getting a more focused approach on what do we do well as an organization, removing a lot of the noise, 
um, and just really focusing on what was working and turning it into a you know long term sustainable profitable business. Um, and Andreas Meinrad, who came in as as CEO um, then back in, in 2015, I think you know very much brought that that disciplined approach. Um, when I joined in early 2019, it was very much sort of coming out of that you know initial focus phase and then saying, okay, you know, where can we double down or where can we do more? You know, what are some of the the strengths or where's the value hidden in Bedvictor? And, you know, one of the main areas was the fact that we operate on our own proprietary technology. Um, and we talked about ways that we could leverage that um, through not quite a traditional B2B approach, but actually working with third party brands who, depending on the markets that they wanted to go into, if we could you know, bring technology or operational services or, you know, a compliant product um, that they didn't have for those markets, we saw an opportunity to actually operate third-party brands. Um, and that's actually what I was brought in for was to to really create and execute on that, call it B to B to C strategy where we were we were white labeling brands, operating them, you know, on our licenses through through brand license deals. Um, and we executed on that very successfully over the course of I'd say 2019 through uh, through last year, um, and on the back of successful execution of that strategy, you know we had a business that was no longer just Bet Victor as a B two C brand, but now operated seven or eight different brands in different jurisdictions around the world, um, and we thought it was appropriate to actually create a new corporate umbrella brand, um, really to house all those all those businesses, which you know. Now was a portfolio of brands, with of course Bet Victor still as the the flagship one, um, but the business is much different now and much larger. Um, so we thought it was appropriate that we we give a new name to it. Uh, that's BV Group, um, and you know I think we'll continue on that evolution, and you'll see much more coming from the organization in terms of partnerships with third party um, and different ways to leverage our technology to create create new revenue streams for the business. I, I suppose the rebranding also gives you a chance to, you know, rather from the leadership from the day-to-day operations, it also helps sort of communicate to the staff five-year, 10-year plan going forward, just so they look, this is this is the roadmap that we've got, you know, and we want you to come along with us sort of thing. The rebrand, while it's useful from an external perspective and helps tell the story of a very different organization to the market, um, I'd actually argue the point you made, it, it's, it's actually even more important internally um, because one of the challenges I think we we saw was being a B2C operator for so long, focused on one brand, the mindset in the organization is very different. Um, as we added new brands and new territories, you know, we found it, it in a way it, it allows for the technology and operations teams to get much more excited about what is now a very different business. Um, and rather than being, you know, it's just a B2C operator, when you look at our business now, it's really a technology and services provider to not only our own in-house brands, but third-party gambling brands, third-party media brands, um, and eventually even third-party licensed operators um, who license our technology for, for their own use. Um, and from a, a talent acquisition and talent retention perspective, that's actually a much more interesting story. Um, and something that you know the organization can really get excited around. As we're coming towards the uh, the end of the conversation, um, you were talking about sort of moving out into new jurisdictions. I mean, is there any particular markets um, that have impressed you with their sort of approach to gambling and certainly gambling regulation? Because obviously, there's there's quite a variety of uh, different models out there. As a private company, um, you know, we 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 don't feel the pressure to have to go out and create a a presence in every single regulated market as maybe some of the larger listed companies you know are expected to do from their shareholders so you know i think we take i'd say a much more i, I don't want to say disciplined approach because it's not a criticism to the to the larger operators but because we're we don't feel the pressure to go into every market um we can take i'd say a much more cautious approach in understanding how different regulation can impact potential profitability how the competitive landscape you know, might allow us to gain a foothold in the market. Um, but, you know, we're, we're not active going out to every regulated market. Um, so I, I probably, you know, wouldn't be qualified to speak on everyone. But what we have seen, um, you know, for all the attention that goes to the markets that 
maybe it seems like they're going out of their way to get it wrong. I think the vast majority of of regulators do get it right. And when I say get it right, you know, they find that that balance between, you know, number one, protecting, uh, you know, their population from from potential gambling harm, while also creating that that sort of healthy competitive environment where regulated mar- regulated operators can compete they can be successful while also keeping the the bad actors at bay um and i think you know the uk is probably the largest market in in europe you know gets a lot of attention for for what they're doing but i think you know while it may be painful for operators to adapt to those changes it'd be difficult to argue that you know they're not focused on doing what's right and i think at the end of the day they're they're taking a very balanced and pragmatic approach to it, um, and I think doing a, a good job of it. Um, you know, we see what's going on in in the U.S. And while we're not active in the U.S. today, um, it looks like most states are taking a similar sort of balanced approach, creating an environment where you know regulated operators can compete in a healthy way, keeping bad actors out. From a taxation point of view, you know, I think most of the states, you know, have are are taking that that sort of balanced approach. I think it's going to be interesting being American myself and knowing sort of the, the litigious nature of that market in general. I think it'll be really interesting to see how safer gambling evolves in, in the US. And, you know, I think, I think there will be a larger impact than what you see today. And I think US facing operators, you know, will probably find it more difficult in the future, but, but for a good reason. In terms of markets that we operate, I think the, the best example, probably where I've been impressed, has been. Um, in Ontario. So I think there were, I know we had some early challenges in terms of interpreting some of the, the regulatory requirements or maybe the time, the timing that they were communicated to the market. Um, but once we got through that, I think, well, I'd say even in every respect, you know, communication with the regulator has been very positive. They've absolutely taken this very balanced approach that that I've been describing. And, and hopefully, you know, they're setting an example that other Canadian provinces will will follow in the future. Yeah, well, we hope that because we've obviously got our Canadian gaming summit there as well. So it's a uh, yeah, it's um, oh, it's it's looking positive on some of those. And like you say, they've they've uh, Ontario have taken a an open, but also been quite interesting how they've restricted the marketing side of things, which where a lot of markets seem to get completely wrong and have gone one extreme or the other. Um, so you know, it's interesting to see how um, how how successful that is as, as a model, and and, and just finally, um, obviously you've been uh, you you live on Gibraltar. You've been there for I think fifteen years. You said, how do you how how do you unwind there? What what do you do sort of out time just to just to re- refresh yourself to uh, yeah, well, get into the vigors of the work the work environment? Well, look, I've I've got a four year old daughter. I've got a another daughter on the way in the next uh, next two or three weeks. So. You know, I'd love to sit here and say that I spend my time outside of the office, you know, doing rock climbing or sailing or something that sounds exciting. But the uh, the reality is, is most of my time out of the office is is spent, you know, with my family and, you know, seeing, you know, my daughter experience the world and, and being a part of that. And you know, I wouldn't have that any other way. Obviously, I, you know, try to spend time with with friends as much as possible and and stay active, go to the gym, because I think that's that's very important. Um, but yeah, reality is I spend most of my time, you know, having fun with my family. Um, you know, I've, I've got a few other, other business interests outside of, of BV through, you know, investments in private companies or, or startups. Um, I like learning about new business models and seeing, you know, different styles of leadership and where I can share my experience with them as well. Um, but I definitely, I see that as more of a, a hobby um, so then work. Of yeah, well, look, I, I think it's, you know, this idea of work-life balance, I, I get that it makes sense for, for some people. For me, I don't like the fact that it implies there's sort of two very different sides of a scale that have to offset perfectly at all time for you to, to, to be happy. You know, I think at least the key for me has been to actually try to blur those lines as much as possible. Um, if I look back in my life, some of the the most fun I've had has been actually working with teams, you know, towards a a common goal and, you know, trying to achieve some, some objective or mission, however you want to put it. And that can apply to work that can apply to playing sports, um, that can apply to outdoor hobbies, whatever it is. But I think, you know, the, 
I think the more you try to blur those lines where, you know, how you make a living is also something that you enjoy doing with people you enjoy doing it with, I think is a really good place to be actually. So, you know, I try to do that as much as possible. And the idea of sort of work in a box, hobbies and fun in another box, um, you know, I think there's a different approach to it, um, you know, where you can try to combine those as much as possible. And then like you say, some of the investment stuff is completely out of the industry and uh, the, the old phrase is a change is as good as, as, good as a rest. So yeah. if you're thinking about something else, it it's, uh, gives you a bit of refreshment. But uh, brilliant. Thanks for your time today, Brent. Uh, no, thank you. Really interesting speaking to you. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot.